I am a firm believer that representation in any form of media matters. I mean, I think the two videos I have on the topic are proof enough. Through all my years on the internet, and even in real life, I've met so many wonderful people with different personalities, views, beliefs, preferences. But one thing they all share in common is how much they love when their existence is acknowledged. Out of all the communities I've met, the LGBTQ community is one that, even to this day, gets a lot of unnecessary shit from the most idiotic people in the world. I can't tell you how many times I've seen them being represented, only for some dumbass to say, Ah, oh, forced inclusivity. Ah, oh, the snowflakes keep pushing their agenda. Ah, oh, the social justice wars keep bringing politics into my media. To get straight to the point, I wanted to do something special for my friends, or even anyone out there who has gone through any sort of discrimination. I may not be the most qualified person to talk about this topic, but it's a good thing I contacted over 40 friends to help me with this project. So take in mind, this is a collective work of people who belong to the same community, and people who care. We do this for you. And hell, even if you don't identify as part of the community, you might even learn something new. Without further ado, this is LGBTQ representation in video games. Well, I think it's appropriate I start this video with the first character I knew was LGBTQ. Bear though, she's often considered one of the first transgender characters in video games. The interesting part is that depending on the region, Birdo is addressed in different ways. Many instruction booklets and sources during the NES era describe Birdo as he thinks he's a girl. Japanese media in general is a bit harsher regarding Birdo's gender, using terms that might seem more offensive to some. Super Smash Bros. Brawl and other games use the pronoun it instead of gender-specific ones. Nintendo of America and Nintendo of Europe usually refer to Birdo as a she, but some translations still use masculine pronouns. It's crazy to think how even to this day Nintendo is still going in circles about something so easy to understand. But you know, I don't think Birdo cares much about that. As she said in Sticker Star of all things, God, fuck this game. Heart of a woman, heart of a man. Both can know of love's grace. As a kid I really didn't think much about Birdo, if I am honest, but you could say that she was my introduction to characters that were different from what I was used to. Actually, the first LGBTQ character that gave me any shock was Poison from Final Fight. Because let's be honest, this is a design that screams sexy, it's so in your face and I love it. I don't mean to sound insensitive, but when I first learned that Poison was born a man, that confused me so much, I genuinely didn't know how to process that. But as I grew up, I realized that none of that matters. I liked Poison because I thought she was cool, attractive, and a bad bitch. And those aspects remain unchanged even after learning the facts. I mean, when my friends sent me suggestions, they pretty much said similar stuff. Sometimes, we just wanna see a girl or girl bossing around. And Poison does that with flying colors. Now quickly going back to Mario. Vivian from Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door the youngest sister of the Shadow Sirens, constantly being put down by her siblings and suffering from an inferiority complex, she eventually joins up with Mario, and as the game progresses, she reveals that in truth, she's kind, compassionate, and eventually becomes more confident with herself. And I mean, what can I say? I adore the classic Paper Mario partners, and Vivian is one of the best. Easy S tier here. But back to the topic. Her identity as a transgender woman has been handled differently depending on the translation. The English and German versions of the game outright remove any implication or reference to her transition. On the rest of the world, they refer to her as a man who is a woman. But then comes the Italian version and delivers this quote. An ex-member of the Shadow Trio. She used to be a man, but now she's a woman and proud of it. Like... Damn! The Italian translators were way ahead of everyone back then. Now, if only Miyamoto wasn't so much of an ass and brought back these incredible characters. Where are they? Killing is making a choice. Where are they? Santiago Flores Lucero from Rainbow Six Sish. I mentioned this guy in my Latin American representation video. If you saw it, you might recall me saying he was a cool guy with an interesting backstory. What I didn't mention is that he's also gay. So now maybe some Latinos will have more reason to relate to this charismatic character. Leo from Tekken. First introduced in Tekken 6. 
a brave, headstrong and charming person who took up fighting after their mother was assassinated and the case was dismissed by the police. Their defining features are their strong sense of justice and their determination to overcome any fear they may have. The most interesting part about Leo is that their gender constantly changes, as they can use accessories for both male and female fighters. The intention of this character is that any player can relate to them regardless of gender. I guess you can interpret that however you want, but the bottom line is that you like them as a character and that Leo is Leo. Continuing with the fighting game genre, we have Testament from the Metal Gear... <sighs> fuck. The Guilty Gear series. I don't know much about this franchise outside of SALT BAD GUY! But when Testament was announced in Guilty Gear Strive, I was surprised with how many LGBTQ friends reacted to them. I think my friend Greg Lee, who was super involved with this video, described better why their inclusion was a big deal. Back when I first saw Testament in Guilty Gear XX, their androgynous appearance was actually a massive inspiration for me coming out as non-binary. A few months ago, they reappeared in the series for the first time in over a decade with an absolutely fantastic surprise. Brand new they then pronounce. Turns out, in some deeply buried lore, they have always canonically been an androgynous person as a result of experiments done to them. Absolutely insane, seeing the character that inspired me to come out become non-binary before my eyes. And then people have the audacity to say that representation isn't important. And don't worry, there will be more beautiful stories like that throughout this video. Juhani from Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. This Jedi Knight is important because she was the first gay character in the series' history, way before Disney introduced the first gay character for the seventh consecutive time. This side of Juhani is first implied by an NPC in case the players were to kill her, but if you decide to save her, she can join you in your quest and later become a romance option only if your playable character is a woman. There was a bug in the earlier versions of the game where she could romance any gender, but patches and subsequent releases ensured that she could only be with women. Sylveon from Pokemon Yeah, not explicitly LGBTQ, but some friends recommended it and I can see why. I've seen trans people use this Pokemon as an icon since its colors, even the shiny version resembled those of the trans pride flag. And I think that's cute. Chris from Deltarune Nothing much to say here, technically speaking, Chris is a plank of wood with some bits of backstory in and there. But what I find so cool about them is how anyone can put themselves in their shoes thanks to their androgynous appearance and everyone using they then pronounce when talking about Chris. Now, if we return to the prequel, we have Undyne and Alphys, a well-known relationship between an extrovert and an introvert, the jock with a heart of gold and the easily overwhelmed but well-meaning nerd, a dynamic that is simple but effective and very relatable to many people out there, and it seems that Toby Fox is going to replicate that through Susie and Noel. We just gotta wait and see, and hopefully, it won't be two extra years. Metal Gear Solid also has a few characters worth noting, like General Volkin from Snake Eater, whose sexuality sort of becomes relevant in the game's plot. But the one my friends really wanted to highlight is Bam, an antagonist from NGS 2 and 4, and I can't blame them. He's remembered thanks to his boss fights, strong presence, and messed up backstory. As a child, Bam and his family were victims to a terrorist bomb. His family perished in the attack and Bam was buried under the rubble for two days until he was rescued, only surviving by drinking the blood of his deceased family, which made him develop a taste for blood. So that's why they call him Vamp. No, Vamp isn't for vampire, it's because he's bisexual. The Majipsis from Mother Tree. These ones were hard to decide if I should include them or not, because it's easy to see why someone might see them as an offensive stereotype. The Okama, as they say in Japan. But you'll be surprised to hear that some friends suggested them. And you know, I can't blame them. The Majipsis are some of the most fascinating and mysterious entities in Mother Tree. But one thing they all share in common is how wise, good natured and likable they are. Nobody in the game thinks ill about them, and they constantly do what they can to help the heroes. They are simply people who exist and do what is right. You know who else reminds me of the Majipsis? Bone Clay from One Piece. 
And yeah, I'm pulling the One Piece has a video game, so it's valid for this video card, once again. But I really love this character, he's genuinely one of my favorites in the franchise. His flamboyant nature is so contagious, it's hard not to smile when he's on screen. He's selfless and righteous. While initially an antagonist, he immediately captures the hearts of the viewers with how he values people and friendships over his duty. Evidence by him sacrificing himself not once, but twice in order to help his friends. Friends. If we are real, One Piece is obviously not the best medium when dealing with the LGBTQ stuff. But I do appreciate that even with that, Bon Chan doesn't care about what others think and is proud of who he is. And this quote from him is something that sticks with the reader. One may stray from the path of a man, one may stray from the path of a woman, but there is no strain from the path of a human. By Bon Clay. Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Literally every character. Let's move on. Ladiva from Grand Blue Fantasy. She's a trans woman who is very strong and beloved by the Sky Dwellers, as well as Grand Blue players because she is the damn goof. As a wrestling champion with thousands of fans, she's never the butt of the joke and everyone always respects her pronouns. Even thugs have the decency to refer to her the way she wants. Ladiva stands out by breaking stereotypes of how trans women should look like according to society, and sees her body as a gift she must respect and use to protect those she loves. There's even a point where she suffered the use of alchemy to change her body into something more feminine, but she refuses because she's happy the way she is. Her entire theme and personality hold a message about learning to love yourself and how you can use that to love others. And if that is inspirational, I don't know what is. Kaine and Emil from Near Replicant. Kaine is a foul-mouthed, brash, and violent woman who was rejected by society for being intersex. She wears clothes that show her more feminine qualities, and is especially fond of her grandmother who was equally foul-mouthed, as she was the only person who ever treated Kaine like a woman. As she joins Nier and Emil in their travels, she becomes more open and shows a kinder side in her own unique way. Now pull your head out of your goddamn ass and start fucking helping us! Emil is simply a character you cannot hate. You really cannot hate him. If you tell me the opposite, I'm gonna... He's so kind, curious, charming. From his backstory to his interactions with the whole party, he's incredibly touching. Emil was all implied to be gay in one cutscene, right before the wedding in the city of Fassa. You'll find a nice bride someday, Emil. Huh? Oh, right. Uh, bride. Yeah, that's not exactly it. But since 2011 onwards, Jokotaro has gone on a record to confirm that Emil indeed loves men and is especially attracted to Nier, the protagonist. This aspect about him is handled in a natural and innocent way that doesn't feel uncomfortable at all, because it's in line with how we know Emil, which makes it all more endearing to the players. Cecil from Final Fantasy IV He's not LGBTQ, but he still needed to be mentioned because he breaks gender norms which inspire a friend of mine. In her own words, I played Final Fantasy IV when I was pretty young, and it was the first time I saw a character that was a man that wasn't super raw or masculine, and was instead very feminine, even wearing makeup, and it made me realize that people can look very different, and they don't have to look like they're necessarily expected to, and that changed my perspective on things like gender and sexuality. Astolfo from the Fate series. This contribution was interesting because I've known Astolfo's existence for years, but even then, I don't know anything about Fate, I don't play nor read Fate. So as an outsider, I always had this image of Astolfo as a sexualized man who wears girly clothes, who is constantly horny and flirts with people, because that's the image the internet gave me of him. But after getting input from my friend Nasser, things change. The reality is that Astolfo is a kind, noble, gene enthusiastic paladin who doesn't care about gender stereotypes or how people perceive him. He simply wants to wear what he wants. He wants to love and be loved back without any prejudices getting in the way. It's so crazy to think how the internet's obsession with sexualizing feminine men made me get a completely different image of a character. And that's something I wanna comment. I've seen people be incredibly vocal against the trans community 
femininity. But for some reason it's only okay when it comes to sexualizing feminine men? It's not only sad, it's hypocritical. Really, give it some thought. League of Legends. Oh shit! Uh, Metal Gear Rising Repentance. For a game that has run for too long, way too long if I might add, and constantly adds new characters, it shouldn't come as a surprise that some of them are LGBTQ representation. My friend Alistair mentioned me some like Nico, Leona, Diana, but one pair that really impressed me are Malcolm Graves and Tobias Felix because there's a whole story behind them. In 2015, there was a massive event called Burning Tides that rebooted some of the lore. The game's writer at the time suggested to her superiors at Riot the idea of making Felix and Malcolm a couple, which, as you could expect, was unaccepted at the time. It took them six years later, in 2021, when a new skin for Graves hinted at something more between these two characters. And it wasn't until 2022, during a Pride event, where this couple will be confirmed official thanks to new stickers and official illustrations, with one of them clearly referencing Brokeback Mountain. You know, in case someone still wanted to pull the Oh my god, they're roommates card. Hades. Better known as The Gods Are Fucking Horny. This game excels in every department. The gameplay, the music, the difficulty, and the characters are no exception. It's incredible how everyone in this white cast is so likable. Except Theseus. Fuck Theseus. And as you will expect, there is a handful of LGBTQ characters. For example, Sagrius, the main protagonist, is bisexual, being able to romance his friend Megara, his friend Thanatos, or both at the same time. But one pairing that excels is Achilles and Patroclus. These two share a side quest that is both memorable and emotional, as Sagrius learns how these lovers grew apart, with both ends having a strong desire to see each other again. What makes this quest so good is the dialogue. How real, how genuine it is. You can really feel the regret behind these characters' words, which makes the end result are more satisfying to achieve. Greg and Angus from Night in the Woods. Nothing much my friends said about them, other than their relationship is cute and entertaining to look at. A friend of mine gave a special mention to Angus because it is implied he may suffer from a bipolarity disorder, and that helped him to feel even more identified with the character. Oh, I get it, he's a bipolar bear. Tatsuya and Jun from Persona 2. A friend was very passionate about this optional pairing because many characters in the game mention how Tatsuya and Jun are the reflection of one another. While they may have different personalities, they complement each other so well, which made them great childhood friends. On top of that, as kids they both exchanged something valuable with one another, and even though they eventually grew apart, they still kept said memento, as if each was carrying a part of the other. Phoenix Wright and Miles Sedgeworth. Well, not exactly official, I did get this request quite a number of times. And let's be fair, when you consider the whole context behind the Ace Attorney series, it's so easy to understand why people believe there's something more going on between these two. They have even been mentioned in magazines as one of Nintendo's greatest romances, alongside Reggie Filsame and Bill Trina. I especially want to mention them, because I've seen people make massive negative outbursts towards others when they ship same-sex characters, especially when it's men involved. And trust me, I used to be part of that crowd, but like, I really didn't win anything for that, and I'm not proud of that old me. But you know, while growing up, I learned an important lesson. It doesn't matter at all, it can be many things, a person just having fun with shippings, or maybe said person interpreted a character different than I did, and there's nothing wrong with that, because say, even if Phoenix and Edgeworth were confirmed a couple, that doesn't eliminate a single thing I respect them for, Phoenix will still be a funny lawyer who cracked impossible cases, and Edgeworth will still keep the best development in the whole franchise, I'm begging you, please play Investigations too. I mean, whether you ship Phoenix with Dahlia I can fix her Hawthorne, or La Diorca, or Miles Sedgeworth, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. But why play it so defensively when others are harmlessly having fun? Give it some thought, because this is not the only example I'll mention. Animal Crossing. 
Not a series that is explicitly LGBTQ, maybe except for Gracie, but you gotta respect how these games have always done an effort to let you be yourself. I've always liked that the games have rarely limited you in what you can wear or which hairstyle you want because of your gender. If you want a cute dress, you rock that shit! And it's neat that the villagers usually refer to you with neutral pronouns. Animal Crossing is a game where you really can be and do whatever you want. Even a villager trade market, but let's not talk about that era. Next up we have the Yakuza series. I thought it was worth mentioning it because the games have had a handful of trans characters. If I am honest, they are not the best representation, but I want to say they have gotten better. For example, when Yakuza 3 was remastered, they removed a sub-story that was deemed transphobic and compensated it with what is one of the most touching ones in the entire series. There's a sub-story where Kiryu goes to a bar and meets up with a masseuse named Ajaka. They strike some casual conversation until she decides to open up to him and that's when she reveals she's in reality a trans woman. But the greatest part about it is that it's not played for laughs, it's the total opposite. It's such a genuine, grounded and heartfelt interaction, with Ajaka expressing her struggles and insecurities as a trans woman. And while Kiryu is confused at first, he's willing to learn while remaining supportive the whole way through. I kid you not, this is one of the few sob stories in the series that has made me teary because it's so real, it's so humane. It also helps that Ajaka is based on a real person, Ayana Tsubaki, who is also a trans woman. That's how you know there's so much sincerity behind this moment. Yakuza has always had great messages about acceptance and equality, and this is easily one of the best. Now it's time we move to Fire Emblem. Ooh, who would have guessed this series was gonna be mentioned in this channel? Anyway, the LGBTQ representation in this series has evolved in interesting ways. Starting with Blazing Blade, we have Lucius, a priest that is often mistaken for a woman due to his looks. Said attribute was the cause of abuse and mockery during his childhood, which causes him to suffer some PTSD. But instead of letting this torment him, he chooses to be positive, kind and gentle. This is exemplified through his relationship with Raven, a bond so strong that anyone can easily imply there's something more going on with this too. It's such an interesting dynamic and their supports are memorable. There's something similar going on in the Telius games and this one might shock or anger a few depending on who you are. Ike. Same situation as Raven and Lucius. He has a dynamic with his friend Soren that has led so many fans to ship them together. And to back it up, Ike and Soren can share an ending together in Rayon Dawn which doesn't happen with anyone else except Ranulf. This is my boyfriend Ike, and this is Ike's boyfriend, Ranulf. I bring them up because this is the same case as Phoenix and Edgeworth. It's a shipping that's been running for years and nothing is 100% officially confirmed. But again, why should it matter if it's canon or not? Does that eliminate the fact that Ike ended racism by sword fighting everyone? Does that nullify Soren's incredible backstory? Not in the slightest. There is no harm in people having fun shipping these characters because their sexuality doesn't affect how amazing they are. That's a lesson that took me years to learn, and I hope you all can too. Other characters worth mentioning from Radiant Dawn are Heather, a thief who only has eyes for women, and Kaisa, a non binary tire who only has eyes for Ranulf. These two characters suffer two curses. One, being introduced in Radiant Dawn, and unless you're plot relevant in that game, you ain't getting much chance to develop your personality. And two, even with that in mind, they were still toned down in the English localizations. Heather remains pretty flirty towards the female characters, but they still took away some lines from her, such as, I joined the army to meet all the pretty girls. I get her. Kaisa is a bit more interesting, through all Radiant Dawn they're always referred to as he, an implication that their non-binary is non-existent. The only implication about Kaisa's identity was in Fire Emblem's 20th anniversary memorial book, where they refer to as the body's male, the heart is female, and it wasn't until New Year 2022, 12 years later when they were added to Fire Emblem Heroes, with everyone using they them pronouns when talking about Kaisa, officially becoming the first non-binary character in the series. 
Since then, the games have become much more open to LGBTQ representation. Fates had the likes of Niles, Rajat, and Soleil. Shadows of Valentia had the extremely likable and sassy Leon, while three houses and top the same sex relationships you could have. But if we are honest, it mostly turned out like. Let's go! Let's go, lesbians, let's go! Because female Violet had an ample selection of women candidates, while male Violet only had Linhardt, who is cool, and two old men that only love him platonically. They sort of fixed it with DLC by adding Jerry and later Jury, the best character ever made, but it really puts into perspective how it is easier for society to accept lesbians rather than gay men, especially when it comes to Japanese games. Oh shit, that's my bias alarm! These next four characters were the most requested of them all. Jill Stingray from Valhalla. Quite frankly, I still don't play this game. I plan to eventually, just not right now. The reason she is in this bias section isn't just because many people recommended her. My friend Vicky wrote a paragraph about Jill that was so touching, I don't think anybody else could have described better why Jill is so beloved. She said, and I will translate it for you, <clears throat> I fucking love Jill, holy fucking shit! I identify so much with her, and it's nice that she also represents the same sexual orientation as I do, bisexual. Jill is so humane, I feel she shows so many sides about her, from being a cool bartender as other characters describe her, to someone who shows her mistakes, her regrets, and even though she seems incredibly mature, she isn't afraid to have a more immature side. Like how she likes dumb jokes and puns, or how she constantly talks to her cat. At the end of the day, I identify myself with Jill. But she's so humane, and they show so many sides about her, that I think any person who plays Valhalla could identify themselves with at least one part of her. Kanji Tatsumi. This is when I can actually back up. You see. Persona 4 is a game I honestly don't like, because its lows are beyond awful, but I've always said that its highs are incredibly good. Kanji is one of those highs. He's a character that can be interpreted in so many ways. His inner struggle can be relatable to many people, and his development, while flaw, is heartwarming. Because outside of his tough and menacing appearance, Kanji is in reality a softie that enjoys things others might consider feminine, and at some point he even questions his own sexuality. These are aspects that he tends to hide from the outside world, because he fears he might be ridiculed for it and lead people to think he's not quote-unquote manly enough, which I'm sure many out there have struggled with that. At the end of the day, whether you believe Kanji is gay, bisexual, or was simply confused, that's totally up to your interpretation since Persona 4 kinda left that part to dry. And don't worry, I'll call on Atlas's bullshit later. But I still believe there's something important to take from this character's message. Rejection is something we all fear, and that leads us to close our true selves from others. But that part we all hide is what makes us who we are, so we have to love and accept ourselves without shame. Now I can say it straight out. Huh? That other me is me. Silvando from Dragon Quest XI. This character is insanely good! Same case as Emil, if you tell me you dislike him, you know what's coming. As other characters in this video, he's not confirmed LGBTQ, but he still breaks many gender norms by fully expressing himself. Silvando is an excellent character because he's a positive influence in everything he touches. He has a flamboyant energy and charisma that rubs into everyone, and every person he meets loves and respects him. One of my favorite moments from Dragon Quest XI is when the whole world is fucked up, but Silvando still manages to turn frowns around and change people's lives by just being himself. He even did that outside of the game. Let me tell you the story of how he impacted my friend Dylan. I do have somewhat of a connection with Silvando and my sexuality. Up until a couple years ago, I never came out to my mom, but I would always play games out in the living room of my mom's house, and my mom would always love to watch me play games, since she used to play a lot back in the day. Anyway, I played Dragon Quest XI when it first came out around her, and she loved Silvando, who was probably her favorite character in the party. 
that made me more comfortable with full coming out to her a bit later on in life. Sylvan though basically gave me the okay to come out to her. With this story, you could say that Silvando achieved what he set out to do. Who... Who are you? Me? Oh, nobody. Just someone who likes to see people smile. <laughs> Now we crank up the bias to the maximum level! Celeste! Holy shit is this game without flaws! You know, I could go on and on as to why this game is an immaculate masterpiece. But right now, let's just focus on Madeline, the main protagonist. She's someone who struggles with depression and anxiety. What makes Celeste so great is how these aspects of her are handled in a very mature way. Every cutscene, from Madeline having panic attacks to her finally accepting her worst side, it's so believable. You see, Madeline is a trans woman, something that is never explicitly said throughout the game. It's something you mostly discover by yourself. But that part of her is just that. A part. Madeline is such a great protagonist because anyone can relate to her in one way or another. From her struggles, to her identity, to her personality. And again, since all of these things are treated naturally and maturely, it's no wonder she was the most requested character for this video! Celeste is a game you can't describe with words. You have to play it for yourself to really understand why it is the masterpiece it is. We have seen way too much representation so far, but you know what was the hardest part about this video? Find out which characters and games were better accepted by everyone involved. Because, for example, me, a Mexican, and pretty much any other Mexican out there, you can put the most basic stereotype, a mariachi, and we will love the shit out of it, really! The only people that will get mad are white people from the first world being offended on our behalf. But with the LGBTQ, that is more delicate, because you just can't throw a stereotype and expect everyone to like it. So that begs the question, what is bad representation? We discussed this a lot, and we reached the conclusion that bad representation only happens when it's dishonest and hypocritical. Blizzard, for example. Have you noticed there wasn't a single Overwatch character in here? I shit you not, nobody. And I mean nobody out of all the people involved in this video mention a single Overwatch character. They only spoke ill of Blizzard because they know that for them, they're just a label and an insurance. Most of you are definitely aware of many of their controversies. Abusing of their employees, stealing the breast milk from their female employees, and the Bill Cosby suit. These and many more were swept under the rug because every time Blizzard was in Thai shit, they would pretend to be progressive to get off the hook. Oh damn, people are catching up with the fact that we hate freedom of speech? Guys, did you know that Soldier 76 is gay? And who can forget the infamous diversity chart? Hey Lucio, what's your culture? You sick monster! By the way, gamers, don't forget to buy our Pride Month merchandise before all of you decide to get mad at us again. I mean, if you like these characters, that's totally fine. But it's pretty sad and ridiculous how shameless companies are. Atlas is also terrible at this. I know, I just mentioned Kanji being an amazing character, and that still stands. But as I said, Persona 4 slows are fucking awful. I think it's horrible when you spend a whole arc and a whole social link where a character learns to love and accept himself despite what society thinks, only to still continue to pull bad taste jokes against him. That's why I don't like the main party from the game, because they're always mean to Kanji for being who he is. The girls belittle him for liking girly stuff, and Josuke because... Ew, you're gay? Well, don't get too close to me or you might harass me, haha. <laughs> Which is ironic, considering he was supposed to be a romantic option at first. Josuke, yes, I am gay. Yes, I am homophobic. We exist. And it's not just four. Persona 5 also has a cutscene where Ryuji is harassed and taken away against his will by a gay couple and... That's supposed to be funny? Yeah, I'm sure the average Persona fan won't think ill of gay people because of that. Thank you, Atlus. What will the community do without you? I was even told that Catherine is awful with this too, as the game has a trans woman whose reveal wasn't taken very kindly by the rest of the cast. 
It's so frustrating because Persona games have great messages that many teenagers and adults can resonate with. Accepting yourself, rebel against society, stepping up against sexual predators. But they still insist on shooting themselves in the foot for the sake of comedy, awful comedy at that, or to fulfill some awful anime cliches. And that's just a small portion of it, because trust me, there are many more examples of awful representation. Like this name. Whoops! Delete the lesbian kissing from our awful Star Wars movie, we don't gonna lose our precious Chinese income, but that's not video games. Still, as dishonest as many companies can be, because no shit, they're companies, that doesn't mean there aren't people out there who genuinely care, who acknowledge your existence, who respect your decisions. I've said this before, I personally don't think representation is a must to enjoy any form of media, but when it's there, and it's done right, it can change a person's life, it can motivate them, it can inspire them. For this video, I received so many messages from people who were happy because they felt identified with a character, or simply because the game let them be who they wanted to be. I mean, do I need to say it out loud? Representation matters! I made this video because I know what it's like to be there, to hide yourself from the outside world because you've been rejected, bullied, misunderstood, to have to create a second personality in order to please others. I've gone through that. And I'm not even talking about my sexuality, I'm talking about being a quirky, hyper kid who loves video games. Do you know how much it hurts when someone close to you tells you, God punished me with you because I was just being myself? I can't even describe it. Now, imagine how scared that gay person must feel of coming out of the closet, and how many insults a trans person must endure every day. It's so sad because unfortunately, society still sees LGBTQ people as something taboo. But at least I want you to remember that there are others out there who love and respect you. And here's another thing. I also made this video because I want those who are not part of the community to at least understand why all of this matters, why people care so much about representation. And there are no excuses because, look, I grew up in a conservative country, in a conservative family, and I spent my entire school life in a conservative Catholic school. And let me tell you, nobody there taught me any tolerance. I was told to discriminate others for being different, to obey without questioning anything, and that gay people contribute to the death culture or some dumb shit like that. Holy shit. I shall make a shelf stories about that. But back on topic. A part of me felt that something about that was wrong, and that eventually led me to meet so many wonderful people. And here's what I'm especially grateful for. Whenever I did something that I am not proud of nowadays, my friends will be patient and teach me why my friendly bantering was hurtful to them, or why this awesome character being gay meant so much to them. The lesson here is that you can learn from others, but you can also unlearn. If society tells you that you need to hate others because they're different, what good does that do to you? Really just throw that away and focus on being a better person for yourself and for others. Or at the bare minimum, mind your own business. Really, it's so simple. Mind your own business. Well, before I leave, I just want to say thank you everyone who was involved in this massive project. I want to thank you, the viewer, for sticking till the end. I really hope you take something important out of this video. Well, if you want to support the channel, I will definitely appreciate that. Now I send you off with one of my favorite quotes from Kiryu Kasuma. Your life is yours to live. You shouldn't have to justify it to anyone else. Thank you.